Welcome to our continuing series of virtual voices hosted by the World Information Transfer. Today, we have the privilege and the honor of having the former ambassador to the United Nations, Dr. Louise Cantrell, a noted diplomat who served as the ambassador to the United Nations for the International Chamber of Commerce from 2007 to 2018. Her role was pivotal in representing the global business network in UN conferences, making notable contributions to economic, social, and environmental dialogues. Post ICC, she has been an advisor to global firms seeking to engage with the UN. Cantra has significant roles in UN conferences like chairing steering committees and establishing the Global Business Alliance for 2030, advancing the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. She also became permanent observer to the UN in 2017, when the ICC attained observer status at the General Assembly. Before her ICC appointment, Ambassador Cantrell held senior roles at various organizations closely associated with UN activities, including serving as the executive director of the International League for Human Rights and the executive vice president of the United Nations Associations of the USA. She holds advanced degrees in demography and economics from the University of Pennsylvania. Over to you, Ambassador Gantrov. Thank you very much, Dr. Durbach. And thank you very much for inviting me to be part of the of, of Virtual Voices and this webinar series. It really gives me great pleasure to share my experience and my, uh, and my expertise to your viewers. And what I plan to do this morning is to follow the model the, by Ambassador Dubois last, last week to spend the first 10 or 15 minutes just reviewing my UN uh, career, my UN experience, and, and, and then uh, focus more uh, intensively on the role that business and stakeholders can uh, and are playing on the, 20, on the achievement of the 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals. For many of your viewers who have heard the Secretary, of Gen Secretary General uh, speak during the last year or two, the first thing one remembers is he frequently meant, he frequently uses the expression, the world is careening towards the abyss. And he will, he will say that the three C's, the triple C's, COVID, climate change, and conflict in Ukraine is creating a situation in which the world is is confronting a historical moment that we have never experienced. These three C's has derailed the progress that governments have been trying to achieve in terms of the, the 17 sustainable development goals. So in many ways, the United Nations is more critical now than ever, ever before. And uh, it is a, the Secretary General also is trying to plan for a post 2030 agenda in which for the very first time, he's bringing in the notion of greater stakeholder involvement. So let me begin my remarks by, by sharing with you my, my history at the UN. I joined the United Nations on January 6th, 1976. So if you do the math, you quickly can calculate that when I'm at a UN meeting at either the, in either the conference room four, or in the uh, trusteeship council or the ECOSOC chamber, I am frequently one of the oldest, if not the oldest person in the room. So I think I have a very interesting and unique perspective that I'd like to share with your, with your viewers today. I joined in, in, in January of 1976, but my love affair with the United Nations began a few years before that when I graduated from the University of Michigan with a BA in sociology and an interest in demography and population, I became, I was hired as a, as a demographic research assistant at a place called the Population Council, which is an NGO that was closely associated with UN activities. I quickly learned 
that the UN Dag Hammarskjöld Library was the place to go. I could go there and do and spend hours on my demographic research. But not only, this was a time when there were no gates around the UN and there was no screening room. And you simply, it was really the people's place. And you could, anybody could walk in, go up to the information booth and, and give the reason why you were there. And they would direct me right over to the Dag Hammarskjöld Library where I would spend hours. And then I'd be directed up to the fourth floor cafeteria where I would be online with diplomats and staff members. This was, I was in heaven. And I would spend, when I was free doing, after doing my work, I would wander, if it was springtime, the cherry blossoms were in bloom and I'd sit in the Eleanor Roosevelt Memorial and read. This was, uh, I, I was in heaven. So fast forward a little bit after I had been to graduate school, got my PhD in demography, I left the Population Council and my very first job was at the United Nations in the UN Population Division of the Department of Economic and Social Affairs. I spent the next 20 years of my career working at the UN, and it was a, it was a fabulous part of, of, of my career. I was involved with um, demographic research and technical cooperation. And this is where I think a lot of my career also overlaps with Ambassador Dubois. I was involved with, in terms of technical cooperation, the United Nations was tasked with assisting all of the newly independent countries in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, in carrying out their first population census. And the demographic division of the, uh, of the, of the, popu the population division was tasked with assisting these governments in carrying out the demographic analysis of these censuses and surveys for planning purposes. So I was spending the, you know, about a third of my time traveling to the poorest countries of the world, to Benin, Togo, Cote d'Ivoire, Senegal, Sierra Leone, uh, Burkina Faso, uh, Rwanda, Uganda, Burundi, all over Sub-Saharan Africa. And some of the, the fondest memories I have is working with the government counterparts in conducting these population censuses and understanding how these data are going to be valuable for them moving forward. So a little aside here is that while I was working there, I also, I got married, I had two children and my husband um, is an architect. He's a preservation architect. So in the seventies and eighties, while I was working, traveling all over the world, I, and occasionally he would pick me up at my office at the UN, he would always marvel. He would always say to me, oh my goodness, what a fabulous place you work. The UN compound is a, a, a architecturally such an iconic building. And we would marvel at the beautiful, the beautiful headquarters of, of the United Nations. So moving right along, we get into the decade of the 90s, and I'm a uh, now by this time now I'm a kind of mid-level professional. And this was also, we have to admit that, that the United Nations of the 90s was not as progressive as it is today. And it was difficult for women to advance their career at the UN. And uh, being who I am and was, I was a little bit frustrated. So finally, and, and headhunters began to call me. So in the mid nineties, I took the plunge and I left the United Nations to see if there was a world outside of the United Nations. And for the next 10 years, I um, worked at several private nonprofits all having close relations and consultative status with the United Nations. The first place I worked was back at my old place, the Population Council, and they hired me as their director of operations. And here I was working on very much the same subject matter that I had been working on at the United Nations, but now from a different perspective. I was working with a, in a sense, like an, an implementing agency, a private nonprofit. So I got to see the world from, from that perspective. 
And I, I have to say that, you know, while I was at the UN and working on technical cooperation projects, these projects were all funded by UNFPA, the, the UNDP, the World Bank. I began to see that, I began to understand that, that you know, um, uh, official development assistance was not necessarily the answer to a lot of the development problems and issues of the least developed countries. And this began, and I began to see that there's, there's got to be a, a more multi-sectoral approach to, you know, to, to resolve some of these issues. So again, as, as Dr. As Dr. Durbach mentioned, I worked, uh, I, I worked at the Population Council. I, I was the executive vice president of UNA USA, a wonderful you know, grassroots organization, the International League for Human Rights. And then in 07, I was appointed the permanent representative uh, to the UN for the International Chamber of Commerce. And this appointment really brought together all the different strains of my career. It brought together my experience about working in a, in a large um, uh, official bureaucracy like the United Nations, but I also was able to bring in my perspective of being a stakeholder, which I think was, was critically important. But now I want to mention something else. You remember I mentioned to you that my husband uh, is an architect, a preservation architect. Well, in 2007, my husband, Michael Adlerstein was appointed by then Secretary General Ban Ki-moon to be the Assistant Secretary General in charge of the Capital Master Plan, which was the 10-year project to restore the UN headquarters to its original mid-century modern um, luster, which, which he did. So, so for, the, for the 10 years that I was the ambassador to the UN for the International Chamber of Commerce, my husband was the assistant secretary general in charge of the capital master plan. And frequently, uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon would, would grab me, uh, you know, if, if I'd pass him in the hallways, which now is a lot more difficult because the hallways are a lot more empty, but he would, he would stop me and he would say, Dr. Cantrell, is your husband going to complete the project on time? And I would assure him, yes, yes, it will be done on time. And it was, and it was. So, um, so that's just to say that, as, as you know, as Ambassador Dubois mentioned, so much in life is is serendipity. Who would have could have predicted that you know uh, that I would spend you know the last the last ten years of my career at the UN as an ambassador, and that my husband, who so admired the UN headquarters, would be so instrumental in in, in restoring this iconic uh, iconic building. But now let me tell you a little bit more about the International Chamber of Commerce, and then we're going to head on to the relationship between business and, and, and the uh, 2030 agenda. So the International Chamber of Commerce is the oldest, most representative, and largest business association in the world. It is based in, in Paris. It was started in 1919 by private sector representatives from five countries. This is coming out of the ashes of World War I. And they were called merchants of peace. They came from, from Italy, France, uh, the United Kingdom, the United States, and Canada. And these merchants of peace felt that countries that trade with one another and who, who invest in one another will not go to war with each other. And they, they held this conviction at, from the very beginning to, to, this, to this very day. And during the 1920s at the League of Nations, and they felt it was critically important for business to speak with governments and to be at the same, and to talk at the table. And so at, during the years of the League of Nations, the International Chamber of Commerce was the voice of business. And over the years, um, they uh, fast forward again, it, coming out of World War II in, 19, in 1945, the ICC, by this time much larger, recognized that they needed to support the fledgling United Nations and the fledgling intergovernmental body that would become the United Nations. So representatives of ICC were, was at the, you know, uh, the various conferences at the in San Francisco at the signing of the of the United Nations and 
the the framers of the of the UN Constitution recognized the importance of that that this governmental body needed to have a mechanism to engage with non-governmental stakeholders. So in their wisdom, they included um, Article 71 of the UN Constitution, which provides the mechanism for, for stakeholders to engage through the Economic and Social Council with the workings of the United Nations. So the International Chamber of Commerce in 1946 was granted ECOSOC consultative status. So I think it was either the second or third organization to be granted that status. So over the years, the, U the International Chamber of Commerce was involved in multiple um, intergovernmental uh, um, meetings, you know, uh, ECOSOC cons consultations and whatnot. And they were, they were very instrumental in formulating recommendations that went on to, for example, the, the, the creation of GATT, the creation of uh, the WTO, and many, many UN, the UN Global Compact. In the year 2000, in, the, in 1999 at a Davos meeting, Secretary General Kofi Annan challenged the private sector to, uh, to join the United Nations to, to attack the numerous problems that the world um, was confronted with. And it was the dialogue between the, the ICC Secretary General at the time, Maria Katawi, and Kofi Annan that resulted in the creation of the UN Global Compact. So you see, there has always been a close um, association with the International Chamber of Commerce and, and the United Nations. And then after I received the appointment in 2007, and we began to embark upon um, the, 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 the conclusion of the Millennium Development Goals and the, the initial thinking about the post-2015 uh, um, agenda and the 2030 agenda, um, we began to say, we began to realize that, that in fact, the, the International Chamber of Commerce probably should be, have some association with the General Assembly. It is in fact, the General Assembly is the preeminent forum. It is the G193. There is no other forum in the world where every single member state has an equal footing. And so we worked with uh, the Sixth Committee. And in 2016, um, the ICC was granted observer status at the, at the UN General Assembly. And I presented my, um, and in 2017, I presented my credentials to Secretary General uh, Antonio Gutierrez. So it's been a it's been a wonderful road, a wonderful career. And but again, there is there is no organization like the UN. It is the world. It is critical to the world, and it is it is a necessary um, institution that needs the support of the world. So with that. What I'd like to focus a little bit on now is how business and other stakeholders are going to be critically important in towards the UN's achievement of the um, 2030 agenda and the 17 uh, sustainable development goals. Um, and I'm gonna give you a little bit of historic, we'll start off with some historic uh, uh, context. And as with, many things. It's all about leadership. And uh, we, the UN has been blessed with some very uh, strong and charismatic and visionary uh, secretaries general. But starting with uh, Secretary General Kofi Annan, it was he who, who um, opened up the UN through the multiple world conferences uh, on sustainable development. He opened it up to non-governmental stakeholders to inform and to um, uh, share with governments the role that stakeholders can play in many of these affairs. So you had in the in the beginning of the 90s, you had the Women's Conference, you had the, the, World, the World Information Society Conference, you had the Financing for Development Conferences, um, and you had the Women's Conference. And all of these had invited 
non-governmental stakeholders, but it was the Rio conference in 1992, which was critically important in articulating an architecture in which stakeholders could participate in the ongoing UN activities related to sustainable development. It created what was called the, um, um, the, the multi-stakeholder groups. And so, so they articulated nine stakeholders at that time in 1992, which included business and industry, women, tr trade unions, science and technology, farmers, um, NGOs, um, the scientific community, uh, and, um, and trade unions. So you had all of these groups articulated. And so in each of the, the ensuing uh, conferences and on the work of the Commission on Sustainable Development, you had these, these groups able to participate, to able to speak during the conferences and able to participate in terms of providing official documentation. And it was, and then moving forward, as I mentioned, it was Kofi Annan who, who, are, who started the Millennium Development Goals and also created the, the UN Global Compact. So this was, this was in this period, in the, in the, in the, it's still in the early 90s, business was always seen as the source of the problem. If you move into the early 2000s, um, you, and you begin to have um, uh, uh, Kofi Annan begin to, and the articulation of the Millennium Development Goals. And by 2005 or six and seven, when I joined the International Chamber of Commerce, the role of business in the achievement of the MDGs begins to become apparent. The MDGs focused on the elimination of extreme poverty. It was influenced by the, the AIDS epidemic and um, infant and child mortality and um, uh, uh, in improving um, literacy and global partnerships. But what became apparent was that the, the reduction of extreme poverty was due to the role that the private sector was, was, was playing in, the, in terms of job creation and in terms of investment and in terms of technological innovation. So the, the, the way business was beginning to be perceived began to be changed in those early years of, of 2000s. And it was Secretary General Ban Ki Moon in in um, in his first in his first um, um, session, and when he he created a whole process to elaborate a post twenty fifteen um, uh, agenda. And even in this, when he created his panel of experts to envision what a post twenty fifteen um, uh, agenda would look like, he strengthened the role of business. But um, now with Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez, he has extended these priorities and he himself, his, his priorities are, as you see here, peace and security reform, gender parity. If, if there's any Secretary General who has done more to improve the situation of women at the UN, it is uh, Secretary General uh, Gutierrez. And he's focused on management reform and development reform in terms of making the field much more um, uh, uh, much more field focused. But the other thing that he has done, of course, is he is he is also now beginning his own process of envisioning a post twenty thirty agenda in the whole process called our common agenda. And here he has even gone a little bit further than Ban Ki Moon and and and. Um, uh, in, in that he has begun to talk about what would a UN look like that had a, a more broader and robust multi-stakeholder engagement. So this is something that's going to be critically important to see how we move forward in, in these coming years. But be that as it may, what I would like to say, you know, uh, as we approached uh, 2015 and the elaboration of the 2030 agenda, it, the role of business became critically important and it was recognized. Whether the, and, and where you could see its recognition was that in the final outcome negotiated doc, documents from Sendai to Addis Ababa to New York to Paris, all of these decisions that governments, all 193, agreed to in contained language recognizing the important role for business in terms of working with governments 
to achieve the, uh, the goals. And um, as I say, member states recognized it and they recognize that it's important to work at every single level, whether or not it's at the global, national and local levels. So now we're in halfway through the implementation of the 2030 agenda, but none, nobody could have predicted the headwinds that have been um, that have buffeted the uh, the efforts to achieve the the 2030 agenda in the form of COVID, in the form of the 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 rapidity of the impacts of climate change, or in the in in the uh, conflict that started in Ukraine, so that. We are, uh, you know, as I mentioned at the outset, the, the Secretary General has said, we are way off track, we are careening towards an abyss, but we have to have faith in the, in the strength of the institutions of the United Nations to right the ship and to bring us back. So the, the high level political forum that'll be taking place at, in New York, just in a few weeks here, in, in uh, actually just in about 10 days, is going to, to focus on just that. How do we redouble our efforts? How do we work together to, uh, to right the ship and to uh, double down and to, and to raise our ambitions? But as, as I said, some of the challenges are enormous and poverty has increased. Official development assistance is no longer going to be sufficient. And um, there are, all kinds of changes that have revealed the, the, the glaring gaps within, within countries and within societies. So again, this, the SDGs provide the roadmap. And I was head of the, head of the business negotiating team that, that assisted in the negotiations of these, um, of these goals. And I can tell you that business, you know, basically endorses and, un, and, and really champions these goals now. They business sees this as the roadmap. And you know, I can I just say a few words as to why the SDGs and you know resonate with business. And a lot of this has to do with the DNA of business and, and what is it at heart, the, the basis of the, the SDGs. And, and how it syncs with how business operates. First of all, as they are articulated, the SDGs are action oriented. They are time framed and they are measurable. I don't know if all of if many of you remember, but the when the MDGs were articulated, there were no goals or targets. We had no way of measuring it. It was all aspirational. The UN, through the the work of both the Statistical Commission and through or the, the work of many parts of, of DESA began to put together a, a framework that makes it possible to both measure and hold everybody accountable to the progress. And what is also important for business at the SDGs recognize that the earth is finite. And increasingly the businesses that are successful are the ones that are sustainable and recognize that businesses have to recognize the importance of their place in the environment. And another point that, that resonates with business is the role of good governance. Role, uh, goal 16 was very important to business. And they, when governments would ask us at the negotiating sessions, what is it that the business needs to be able to you know, uh, um, participate in a constructive way? And it was, you know, it was having you know, uh, uh, good rules of law you know, uh, anti-corruption, all of these things were gonna be important for business. And um, again, as I said, the SDGs provide a roadmap and, but, but, more, but most important of all of this is the notion that we are all in this together, that business is one important stakeholder along with members of civil society and along with governments. And that not one sector of society or one element of society is going to be, you know, can do this on its own. And therefore it's important to create the trust. And that's what the United Nations does. It provides the platform that all these, these diverse elements of society can come together and be able to inter, you know, exchange information, 
it, you know, interact with each other to reduce the tension that might exist. I'm just going to conclude this with, as I mentioned, in in, in a few uh, days, the high level political forum, which was created out of the Rio Plus 20 conference, um, will meet. The high level political forum is the preeminent platform where progress on the 2030 agenda is discussed, measured, and evaluated. So this is like the, the key body. It, it reports to both ECOSOC and to the General Assembly. And um, this year is going to, is it, in a sense, the midway between, uh, between the launch and, and the conclusion. So it's a, it's a critically important, there's gonna be an SDG summit in September alongside the GA opening. So we're, we're at a critical moment. And again, it, it is a critical, time for um, for all stakeholders to 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 rally together uh, at the UN during the, the second week of the HLPF the UN and um, has created the SDG business forum and this is a day-long event in which business can present to member states what what uh, you know their progress in in uh, and where they have been achieving progress in terms of of the SDGs, uh, and where you know uh, business is is brought to account. So um, they want to be able to demonstrate what they've been what what they have done to to achieve the twenty thirty agenda. So as so as I say, we're at a critical time in the history of the UN. Um, these these days and months could not be could not be more important. And, but that's not to say the world has, has needed, has never needed the more, the UN more than it does now. So I look forward to, so, to some questions. It's time to take this. Time. Thank you very, very much, Ambassador, for an exceptionally clear analysis of not only the history, but the sustainable development goals and what is necessary to achieve uh, at least some of them, if not all of them. And now we will turn over to Susie Halleck, our moderator with questions. Susie? Thanks, Dr. Durback. Echo your comments. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for the insightful presentation. Our first question from the audience is, are there any interesting projects that you were a part of at the UN that felt most engaging and impactful for you that um, you'd be able to share with the audience? Sure. So again, I think I mentioned that I, I joined as ambassador to the UN in 2007. Um, and, um, to, and at that time, um, it was difficult, actually, for business to get interested in the United Nations. I was involved in representing the International Chamber of Commerce at the Commission on Sustainable Development, Financing for Development. And it was not easy for me to get businesses necessarily to to come. So this was a this was a challenge for me. And but then in 2008, you might remember we had the financial crisis of 2008 and 9. We had the um the food crisis of 2008 and 9. And suddenly some of my members from uh from um from business began to wake up that there was a role and a platform at at the United Nations. So um uh so what what I would say my most interesting you know project was developing the interest amongst my business colleagues of the importance of being engaged at at the United Nations and and at the same time to develop the trust and confidence for member states in businesses you know um, um, genuine interest just to see where they could they could contribute. So as I say. 2007, I had a hard time getting uh, um, getting businesses to to come to my UN meetings. Again, by 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 20 by 2012 at the Rio Plus 20, we had hundreds of businesses represented at, at Rio Plus 20. Fast forward at at the Financing for Developing uh, Conference in Addis in 2015, I had 800 representatives coming, and then at the very first. Um, SDG Business Forum, we filled the General Assembly. 
So I think, um, um, so we were having, we had business representatives from, from every single sector and, you know, getting small and medium sized enterprises also to, to see the value. And we worked very closely with our colleagues at the UN Global Compact and at the UN Foundation and at many of the other smaller uh, business associations so that we would, so that we were always on a, a similar page and we and we and, and uh, we weren't necessarily working across purposes. That's incredible impact. Thank you for sharing. And you highlight a great point that previously there was not much uh, business engagement uh, with with the UN and uh, the public and private sector partnerships are critical to achieve the sustainable development goals. Um, so was just wondering if you could highlight any any other um, public private sector. Um, kind of collaboration that that was interesting and contributed to a sustainable development goal. Sure. Uh, well, also, you might be aware that during this same time, there was an interest among a lot of the development agencies, um, such as USAID, the, the Swedish Development Agency and whatnot, to, and also the World Bank began to work directly with, um, with a lot of businesses because what they began to realize was that the role that, 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 develop, that, that official development assistance could play is to work with, with private sector entities to, um, in a sense, to help mitigate the risk of investment. And so, so we have, something called the the global partnership for effective development cooperation is something that i worked very closely with in trying to make those partnerships a reality because one of the things that came up during the 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 negotiate the uh, uh, all of the work in the whole financing for development arena is that there are many opportunities for private sector um, investment for example in least developed countries this initiative to bring together the development agencies and private sector entities to uh, both help locate um, investment opportunities and to work together has been extremely, extremely beneficial. Thank you for sharing. And as an experienced professional, what advice would you have for young um, attendees on this call who are interested in a career in international diplomacy and working with international organizations such as the UN? Definitely go for it. You can't get a better career. And um, as as my colleague Ambassador Dubois said, you have to be open to serendipity. You don't know where your next opportunity is going to come, but always keep your antenna open and try a million different things. And and um, and you know, I think I mentioned at the beginning that I. When I joined the UN, I actually thought that I was going to spend my whole career there. I was going to retire, you know, in my, well, at that time, I think retirement was 62 or maybe 60 even. And actually, my very best job happened when I was in my 60s. So there you have it. But, um, uh, but things change in life. And I was getting frustrated because at that time, the UN was not promoting women. And it was so frustrating for me. And so when somebody called me with an opportunity, I said, okay, I'm gonna try and see, let's see what happens. And I, I, I did with great fear, and, but it was the best thing that I ever did because I exposed myself to issues and, and things that I never would have been exposed to. I think I mentioned that for a, for a time I was head of a, of the International League for Human Rights. And um, in that capacity, I was going over to the uh, Geneva quite a bit on the Human Rights Commission and, and whatnot uh, to present things there. But uh, I was exposed to a whole host of, of human rights organizations and issues that I had, you know, that I was that I had never, I would never have been exposed to, and which opened my mind and my and my perspective tremendously. So uh, again, I would always urge my my, I, and I do. I urge every you know the young people that I that I work with, um, uh, 
just, you know, expect that things might change and embrace change. Great advice, thank you. Um, the next question is related to work-life balance. So how did you balance work and family while holding senior positions and also having a husband who's in a busy career as an architect? What helped you kind of keep balance in the midst of everything? That's a great question. That is a great question. And um, I will tell you that uh, I consider myself the most fortunate person in the world. I had a husband and family that su always supported everything I, I did, but it wasn't easy. And I, and I, and I, uh, and in fact, uh, my travel, and I traveled when my children were young uh, in elementary school and whatnot, I traveled about a third of the time. And my husband traveled a third of the time, probably, but always domestically. But we never, ever, for good, either good scheduling or whatnot, we never overlapped, except for once. Once we were both, we couldn't get out. We and so and we had a we had a, a a nanny who didn't live in, but she moved in and took care of the two kids. And so when we got home, we said, "So how did everything go?" So she said, "Oh, everything was great. We all five of us, we all slept in your bed. The two dogs, the two kids, and me." <laughs> Uh, and so you just have to roll, roll with, with the punches, but you know, I, uh, um, I was always fortunate in that I always fully believed in my work and I believed in, in my family and I believed in, I had my two boys. And when I would go to my, 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 um, my parent teacher conferences, I would my the, the teachers would say you must you must walk on clouds they said because your your two boys they always say you know uh, they they're always so proud of everything that you do and I would used to go in and give them a, a little presentation uh, to their to their classes about the United Nations and what a population census was and always you know with a few slides of pictures and everything and so um, you know you just have to if you keep if you keep in your mind that you know your your family is as important as your career, but both are important. Thank you. Um, so switching to um, a heavier topic, many um, students on the line are joining from Ukraine. So they're interested to hear uh, what international bodies like the UN do for wars like the one in Ukraine and how does what's happening kind of violate the core principles of the UN? Any Anything you could um, speak to on this topic? This is a great question and it is very frustrating. I mean, when you have a country like Russia who's a member of the P5, how do you, how do you respond to that? How do you answer that? I mean, clearly, and, 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 and the secretary, I mean, they're all where we are in dire need of reform. You know, in just in the same way that the UN made itself fit for purpose for the 2030 agenda, the UN now has to make itself fit for purpose for this post 2030 environment. And we're 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 in the midst of it now, even though it's it's not. You know, climate change is happen, happening so much more rapidly. Um, we, you know, the 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 UN play. I mean, with the with the Conflict in the in the in the in Ukraine, the UN played an important role in getting the grain out. You know, getting the shipments of grain out, and the role that that's going to play in terms of easing the food crisis. And it's that kind of and and hopefully, you know, if negotiations, well, clearly we're 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 not near a point of negotiations yet, but at a certain point, you know, there will be a role. For the UN, but the very fact that the UN stepped in immediately to deal with the food crisis, I think, is is emblematic of what the of what the UN can do. Thank you. Um, this one's more of an idealistic question, but um, do you foresee a world where where we're more at peace and their wars are are not happening as much as they do today? They've decreased over time, but. Um, is it an inevitable phenomenon? And what does the UN do to sort of prevent these wars? I, you know, I have nearly a 50 year perspective. I've been walking around the UN corridors for almost 50 years. And 
this is a very troubling moment that we are living through right now. And, uh, and as I was chatting with Dr. Durbach at the very beginning, uh, you know, she and I shared that these are troubling these are troubling times and and I'm very thankful that I am the age I am. I have often told my younger peers, my decade of the 60s was my best decade of ever, 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 ever. And just, you, I mean, I can't wait for you all to become 60. It's the best, it's the best time. That being said, I have to admit that I grew up in a time when so much positive change happened for women, for public health, for you know, uh, for life expectancy, um, I I frankly think that one of the best you know uh, revolutions for women was the family planning movement and the ability to access um, uh, you know um, uh, uh, contraception. That was a dramatic change in in the world, um, and now we're seeing uh, we're we're going off track in so many ways. And you know, you see in the in this country that um, um, we have questions about you know the place of our democracy going forward. So it, these are troubling times. But I think if if you are somebody who has walked in the corridors of the UN, you do still believe that the that the arc of history is really long. Maybe hopefully this is just a little blip, and that we are going to continue marching forward. And that the gains that we have been making uh, in terms of, you know, uh, life expectancy, uh, equality and whatnot will march forward in a, in a stronger, in a stronger way once we, once we sort of navigate this blip. And you mentioned um, right now we need the UN more than ever. It's kind of, we're in this um, global energy transition. We have um, we have set deadlines for ourselves to meet all of these more climate related goals, but also social and governance related goals. Do you think it's possible to achieve um, all of the sustainable development goals in according to the deadlines that have been set globally? Well, you might recall that we, we did achieve, sorry, sorry. sorry. We did achieve uh, we, we we did achieve uh, a good deal of the MDGs, even though it's hard to measure them, this and that. But the most important one was reducing extreme poverty. I mean, this was a major change in in the world, you know that, and it showed it definitely showed that there was a role for global goals, and it would it 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 really um, empowered. Uh, Secretary General uh, Ban Ki Moon to basically put together this whole, you know, uh, mechanism to create a set a roadmap. Now the question is, how will the UN deal with these headwinds? And I think a lot is going to come out of the the upcoming HLPF because we're going to have all the member states in there deciding, okay, what are we going to do to get ourselves back on track? On track? How are we going to recommit ourselves? You know. So I think a lot is a lot is riding on both this this session of the HLPF plus the SDG summit in September. Um, you know, the it, it, it's it's not it, it's not guaranteed that 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 we'll achieve the goals. Hopefully, we'll achieve a lot of them. You know, and get ourselves back on track. And the you know the ensuing years are going to actually create. Put, make it make a, make us aware of what our new challenges were in the same way that we we redesigned the roadmap with the with the the 17 SDGs what was important in 2000 is very was very different in in 2015 and what's going to be important in another 5 or 10 years will be also very different the whole issue of you know ai and you know how are we going to navigate uh, that conundrum is going to be critically important yeah on that note with uh, different environmental issues that we're facing today since they were first developed um digital ai the war etc do you think um do you think there is room to kind of update the SDGs in the near future, or do you foresee that happening? Well, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see whether or not 
the UN and the member states, um, you know, uh, right now, I think that the, the member states are, are negotiating a document both for the summit and for, for the HLPF. So it'll be interesting to see where that, how that plays out. Um, you don't know whether or not they're going to do some kind of amendment to the SDGs. You know, you know, you, one could imagine a scenario where definitely sufficient, insufficient progress is, has been made. So you, you, you do an amended, you know, roadmap or, you know, the decision is taken, let's redesign the roadmap, you know, uh, essentially, because so much, so much more um, important challenges have presented themselves and and will need to be uh, addressed. So as I say, I think the upcoming HLPF, the upcoming summit are gonna be critically important to get a sense about what direction. As I mentioned, the Secretary General's common, our common agenda hints at an expanded role for stakeholders. And to my way of thinking, this is, this is all to the good. In terms of what's needed to be an effective UN ambassador today, um, are there kind of characteristics or traits or skills that you can highlight for the audience? Absolutely. I learned so much about diplomacy in my role. And these are tools that will do anybody, tools that will do you for, for life. They are invaluable tools. So one of them is listen. Always, always be sure to listen. The next one is put yourself in the other person's shoes to whom you are talking. Try to actually sit in their seat. So many times when I'd be sitting around the table, I would have to make myself think, okay, I have to listen and I have to put myself in the other person's shoes. And so much changes when you do that. And you, um, uh, as soon as you put yourself in, in another person's shoes, you see things from a different perspective. And you have to try, you have to force yourself to do that. You have to force yourself to see things from another perspective. And then you can be more understanding and you can be more effective in your own shoes. <laughs> um, what are your thoughts on the future of media in the face of increasing challenges related to censorship and disinformation, similar to what we're seeing in terms of propaganda in places like Russia and security issues and breaches that we face? Any, any thoughts or perspectives on that as the side of the world that's changing? I mean, that is something that sort of like is, is, is coming upon us like a, like a, like a, a you know, two ton truck almost, you know, and that was not foreseen in 2015 at the time that the, that the 2030 agenda was articulated. And that is something that, that, that the global community is going to have to face. And every country is going to deal with this differently, but you would hope that the UN is going to be able to provide that venue either through the ITU or, or some, you know, agency is going to have to step up and play a, a more you know, uh, um, important role and to be able to share views and, 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 and be able to, to make progress on, on that because it's definitely troubling, that's for sure. Do you have any experiences or lessons learned in, in this area um, throughout your career that you can share? Uh, <clears throat> only that, um, uh um to to have as i i always had a modest profile <laughs> that's that's really good <laughs> especially how we are kind of now more inclined to share everything but that can not always be the best thing to do so right. thank you um so Next question is, um, do you consider like the conflict in Ukraine, as you called in your speech, a war? Can we call a war a conflict? And is this not a substitution of concepts for world diplomacy today? Mm. Right. Mm. Well, I mean, it, it is the largest ground war in Europe since the Second World War. There's no, there's no denying that. And as I said, it's terribly problematic to have one of the members of the P5 
at the UN, uh, you know, the the aggressor in this in this uh, in this war. So um, uh, it, uh, I, I unfortunately, you know, I, I'm not. I uh, I don't know where this where this ends up. You know, and who will be the players in terms of you know uh, ne negotiating the end to it and what will happen? I I just think it's we're we're too much in the throes of it right now to be able to foresee how it's going to how it's going to end up. But it, for sure, it will have it will have an impact on on the, the 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 role of the United Nations in terms of peace and security. It will force the UN to to uh, to to rethink it, you know, how it, how it, uh, its role in this area. Um, and I hope that happens sooner rather than later. Looking toward uh, the UN Climate Change Conference in Dubai this year, do you have certain expectations on how things will go um, or uh, will it be kind of a pivotal conference in your perspective? Again, another, critically important meeting coming up. And I'm pleased to say that, you know, again, the International Chamber of Commerce plays a focal point role there in terms of business. And I wanna say that I find it, I, I think it's in watching everything over, over the years, especially in the climate change uh, um, uh, arena, uh, business has played a leadership role in many ways. In some ways, people, people say that business are ahead of national governments uh, and they are moving the agenda faster because the markets are moving the agenda faster than than the government leaders are um uh, unfortunately you know again politics uh, you know it, uh, overlays everything and so we just have to hope that uh, the the governments will come there prepared to make the necessary uh, you know, commitments, agreements, and live up to the commitments. You know, there there has been some positive headway in terms of funding for um, least developed countries to deal with, you know, adaptation uh, regarding what they need to do to, to address their climate uh, change issues. But, you know, um, people have to live up to their commitments. This is this has been the light motif for as long as, you know, for the whole time, that, for the 50 years I've seen the UN, the failure to live up to the to the to the maximum to the to the promised commitments, and um, you just have to. That's the other thing about diplomacy. You, you just need to have the long term perspective and recognize the even even small steps forward. So you know, five years ago, uh, people were not you know, living up to their financial commitments, they're beginning to. So you just have to hope that, you know, this will be expanded and, and continue. Agreed. And it's so interesting, as you mentioned earlier, that we've had increased engagement from businesses um, with the UN and uh, COP was an example of that. Um, uh, I recall I attended COP 23 in Bonn, Germany, and I didn't see as much business presence as I did um, in COP26 in Glasgow, uh, where I saw every major firm had a presence, people were, they were bringing innovations and, and showing their commitment. Did, have you kind of seen an impact in terms of achieving the climate goals as a result of, of these businesses getting more and more engaged? Well, yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, and I say this because um, increasingly, businesses recognize that they can only survive and flourish in societies that survive and flourish. And they now recognize the biggest challenge to, uh, to society's survival is climate change. And so faster than you can imagine, they are, they are making the changes that are, that are going to be necessary. And again, many of these companies feel that they are pulling their government leaders along. So I, I, I think that having all of these stakeholders together at these climate conferences is so critically important. Agreed. Um, I'll turn to Dr. Durback. Do you have any questions that you'd like to cover? Uh, I was just thinking uh, 
uh, to your presentation, which is extremely important. And also you mentioned a lot of uh, um, uh, basically philosophical approaches. Uh, personally, I think that uh, we need to readdress a couple of issues. One is the issue of equality. Uh, it is being bantered around, but uh, there is, you really need to define what does equality mean? Does equality mean that some people do whatever they want and some people do what is good for the environment and for the world? Uh, population growth is perfect example. We know that Africa's population is going to double by 2050. Now we know that uh, the developed countries, the population is going to go down. So you cannot measure equality from the same perspective. The second one that I was thinking about, the rethinking of the charter. If you have a member that basically ignores every single article of the charter, something needs to be done to a world that is going to be contaminated, that is going to be overpopulated and the world that they will not be able to survive because we're destroying the rainforest, we're destroying the oceans. I think that these issues are very important. I'm very glad that you touched on them. So thank you very, very much for a very important presentation. And Susie, thank you for the hosting and have a very good week. Take good care of yourself and goodbye.